What on Warhammer gang, it's me, Opinions Guy, and I'm back again to waste your time with my presence on camera. You know, just for this video, I'm gonna follow your advice, Alex, so let me know what you think. So today, we're gonna to be doing a list for the weakest starts for every faction. These are the starts that set you back the most and cause you to spend twice as much time to get half as much progression as others. These will be the starts that have a terrible location, hard fights, and a weak army to do the fighting with. These lists aren't opinions and are cold hard facts, so if you disagree, you're wrong, and you're welcome to cry about it in the comments of Alex. How was that? Did I distract you a little bit less? Let me know in the comments. Anyway, I'm gonna do it my way for the rest of the video, so let's just jump right into this list. First of all, we have the Beastmen, and honestly, since their rework, none of them really have it that hard, since their rework kind of took them from, you know, bottom tier faction to a ridiculously strong faction, so even the hardest one is still pretty damn easy. All it really comes down to is where they start, who they fight, and what they're fighting them with. So when you stack it up like this, I think it really does have to come down to Kazrak, but honestly, it could be any of the three that aren't Torox because he's so ridiculously overpowered compared to the rest of them. In the end, to me, Kazrak has the hardest starting war in the middle of the Empire and only has some Minotaurs, a Chariot, and himself, who's a pretty mid-tier fighter, to take it all on with. He also has to deal with that Stein War, which is the Wood Elves and Magical Forest, which is always a pain, even with the OP Beastmen. There's just nothing about it that is easy as the other ones, even for Malagor, who starts in the Badlands. You know, once he gets his magic online, he's going to have a way easier time than Kazrak. Now, it's not stupidly difficult by any means. None of the Beastmen are, like I just said. But, if you're looking for the hardest Beastmen start, then Kazrak is probably your guy. Coming to Bretonia now, and this one obviously it comes down to Alberic or Joan of Arc, because let's be honest, Luen is King of the Castle, and obviously Faye's the easiest. Now, Alberic starting in Lustria, triggers the eight brain in me to say, yeah, he's definitely the hardest because, you know, Lustria bad. But Lustria, honestly, it's not even as bad as it used to be. And for Alberic, you know, it won't have the worst time there. It won't be super duper as easy, easy as it would have been in the homelands, but it's not as hard as it could be. Rapunz, however, starting in the desert, she has a buttload of new enemies that have just got off at her stop. So her starting location is a lot harder than it once was. Not only does she have the usual challenges, you know, navigating the desert with all that water and stuff, and the vampires and the tomb kings, and pretty much everyone there who doesn't like you apart from the other Bretonians and the dwarves. But now, once she gets a little bit more into it, you know, turn 15, maybe turn 20, she's gonna have to deal with Manfred, uh, maybe Volkmar if she can't make friends, she's got Scarbrands and off, she's got a bunch of greenskins all over, she's got Skaven, she's got pretty much everything in the desert she doesn't want to deal with, she's gonna have to deal with. And as I said, aside from the other Bretonians in the area, you're gonna be pretty much alone against this swarm of other enemies. Again, this is another close one, and it honestly could probably go to either Alberic or Aponce, but I'm just gonna give it to Aponce because of the massive migration into the Badlands. That area, pretty much everyone that starts there, is turning the difficulty up quite a bit. It might not start out all that terrible with a fairly easy style war versus the vampires, but it can quickly go downhill if you don't prepare for the absolute shit show that is headed your way. Demons of chaos and it's, it's, it's Daniel. He's the only option, winner by default, let's move the fuck on. Next up, the Dark Elves, and can it really be anyone else other than Malice? What do you think, Louis? <laughs> yeah, I'm glad you agree. Since he was added, he has always been the hardest Dark Elf start, and even with his move around the map to be slightly close to his homeland, uh, not much has changed. There's just nothing about him that sees it. First of all, he starts fairly far away from all his friends, and while this did work for Rakath, and he in fact was the strongest faction, his mechanics uh, really carried him, whereas Malus's just don't, and starting in the middle of the Chaos Wastes, meaning you're just going to be fighting pretty much everyone unless you let Sarkhan take control of pretty much the entire campaign. So if you want to move in any direction, you're going to have to fight, and I know that's, you know, Total War 101, but you have no allies that you can even pretend to be friends with for a little bit. On top of this, you can choose to keep Hagrief or sell it. I would recommend selling it because having two places to control at the start of the campaign really makes it a lot more difficult. Uh, so if you can only get it onto one, that is a great bonus, and also all the cash means that you can have a nice injection in your armies of, you know, a bunch more units, a bunch of buildings, etc, etc. And on top of all this, you have to manage possession. As I said, if you want to let Zarkhan take control of the entire campaign and be friends with the demons, you can do that, but if you want any control over your entire faction and clear the Slanesh corruption out every once in a while, you're going to have to spend a lot of money on these potions to regain his sanity, which is a constant drain your economy. It's just, it, it just adds a massive layer of complexity. He's not really got anything going for him, Malice. That's the problem here. Like, everything about him just makes it harder. His starting location, the possession, no friends, the jewel start, it's pretty rough. He's not quite as far from home as he once was, but he's certainly not in his happy place, and he's for sure the hardest Dark Elf start. Next up, we come to the Dwarves, and this one is pretty easy, as it always has been. We're, of course, going to go for Belengar Ironhammer. Everything aside from his Karak 8 Peaks quest is honestly just fine. In fact, I would go as far as saying, without that quest, he'd be pretty strong. 
You know he's got the four ancestral heroes, which give him a great boost in the early game, can win pretty much any battle, but a 50% increase in upkeep for the dwarves, which already have pretty expensive upkeep as it is, tends to be massively crippling. It means that he needs to make a beeline for Karak 8 peaks pretty much from turn one. You secure his Stein province, and then you hop, skip, and a jump across the mountains or the Badlands or whatever to get there as quickly as possible and take it as soon as you can. And if you get there and you can't take it because you've got an early game army and you know it's got a big old garrison, then you're screwed because then your army's all the way over there and it's probably dead and you have no cash. It's, you pretty much get one shot, and if you mess it up, you need to start the entire campaign all over again. Now, once you take control of Karak 8 Peaks, he's really not that bad. In fact, as I said, he's pretty damn strong. He's got decent campaign mechanics. The Ancestral Heroes really help him out. But until you get in control of Karak 8 Peaks, the first few turns are really, really struggling. If you like using dirt cheap units and paying out the Nostrum, then Belagar is the guy for you. There's not really much more to say here. It likely will always be Belagar, unless they introduce a new Dwarf Lord who's basically naked and afraid in the middle of the Badlands. Next up, we come to the Empire, and we have another certified hood classic in the realm of difficult starts. And I'm, of course, talking about Marcus Wolfhart. Now, I toyed with the idea of Volkmar since he does start out in the Badlands. And honestly, if these were identical Lords with identical mechanics, everything was the same about them apart from their starting location, Volkmar probably has the worst location overall, you know, he's got Manfred right there, and he's in the middle of the Desert Badlands area, so, you know, there's a whole tide of legendary lords just waiting to clap his cheeks. But, Max's campaign mechanics screw him over beyond belief, it's incredible. Now, we're mainly talking about the hostility mechanic. All this means is every time you expand, every time you attack, every time you do anything, pretty much everything that's nearby to you is going to start to kill you and they're just going to be really angry that you're invading and colonizing. Now, there aren't as many legendary lords here, so progressing won't be as difficult as it once was, but with that hostility, every move you make will be met with feedback from the enemies in the form of get out of our lands. Combine this with the limited recruitment, and you can quickly be overwhelmed once you get attacked by lizards, rats, vampire coast, dark elves, everything will be on your ass to try and chew you out of Lustria. His four heroes do help him out quite a bit, but he still has it pretty rough and he's constantly battling against his neighbours to make any headway whatsoever. This is the closest you can get to This Is Total War without intentionally doing This Is Total War. Next up we have Grand Café and as I said in the best starts for every faction, um, Grand Café honestly have pretty much won the balanced starts in the game between the two lords, which is uh, quite fitting for their harmony. <laughs> now, if you watch that video, you may remember that I gave Meow the easy starts. That, of course, means that Zhao has the hardest start, and it pretty much comes down to his starting location and what is surrounding him. When you look at Meow, you know she's got the Great Bastion up top, she only has to really fight internal Café walls. Sure, she has to deal with Snitch, but it's nothing too serious. But for Zhao Ming, yeah, he just starts at the bottom of Café. He's completely exposed, he's got the Ogres, there's Helm and Gorse, there's Kugaf. There's Nakai eventually. There are just so many avenues for enemies to come to that you need to constantly be on the defense by building garrisons from turn one. He has no great bastions to rely on, no mountains for cover. Pretty much everywhere around him, enemies can come from, so you need to be ready at all times. Now, his starting army and himself, perfectly good. Very, very strong starting army with his big dragon form. But that starting location is just way more open than Meow, and that is really what it comes down to. Now we come to the green skins. Now, back in the day, Skarsnik would have been a sure thing. He used to start equally as far away from Karak 8 Peaks as Belagar, and equally was screwed over by it. But he starts a lot closer these days, so he can just make a hop, skip, and a jump and take it in a couple of turns if he builds an army up very quickly, which is the green skins you can. You know, if he just does a lot of fighting, a few raising, gets a nice wire on the go, he can take Karak 8 Peaks in a matter of turns. No, no, the worst start location to me has to go to Grom the Ponge and hold your gasps. I know that Grom is insanely strong once he gets on the go, but the problem is he needs to go on the go first. He still starts in the middle of Bretonian lands, surrounded by enemies. He's got the Wood Elves right there, he's obviously got the Bretonians, he's got the Empire just to the north, he's got the High Elves just across the sea, he's got Vampire Counts, kind of close if Heinrich ever decides to come out of his mountain hold, which he never does. He has literally been in that mountain hold for like half of Warhammer 2's life cycle and the entire Warhammer 3 life cycle. I don't think I've ever seen him expand out of it. Can the someone fix his AI and make him just a touch more aggressive, please? Anywho, he has to break free of his capital city and expand pretty much towards the Badlands where all the other Greenskins are, so you know he can do the tribe leaders and get his momentum on the go, which means that by the time he gets there, the Greenskin will be a lot stronger and a lot harder to take out because he's moved such a long distance. He won't be as strong as they are because he won't have had a chance to build up his army, so he's going to be a lot weaker. So yeah, he has a massive challenge, and also all the lands directly around him are unsuitable. So if he wants to expand directly, you know, come out of this settlement, build a settlement here, and make a nice settlement chain down to the Badlands, he's going to suffer doing that because of the harsh climate preferences. He just has the roughest start. Everywhere around him is unsuitable.
accountable, so to make any progress whatsoever without waiting a million turns and paying out the nose for upkeep and buildings, he's going to need to leave a massive gap, make it to the mountains and occupy there. Now his nearby enemies aren't the worst, they aren't the best either, but his town location combined with the fact that he has to get all the way to the Badlands and his army and himself aren't ridiculously overpowered right out the gate, it just means that he has the roughest start of all the greenskins. As I said, once he gets on a roll, he's hard to stop, but you need to get on that roll first and that is where his challenge is. Come to the High Elves now, and for me, it really comes down to two or three candidates. Uh, first up, we have Teclis, who, of course, has always been one of the rougher starts. Uh, he's moved from Lustra and is now on the tail end of the Badlands, so still has it pretty rough. Elfarin, of course, has the potential for the dual start if you don't want to give up Tor of Rest, which you kind of wouldn't since that's his whole deal. And Imric has his Dragon Hunts, which, admittedly, once you get on the go of them, are ridiculously strong because of the units you can get, but the first one and getting over that hump can be pretty challenging. Now I think in the end I would have to give it to Altharion and it's mainly down to the dual stat. Now I can get rid of that dual stat as I said, but you know the high elf gameplay is, you know, mainly defend the donut. So if you don't use the donut, especially as Altharion, you're not going to be using them to their full potential and you're not even going to make use of one of his full mechanics, which uh, kind of buffs the donut. And if he gives up Tor of Rest, he's then going to have to expand into an area which is far more hostile. We've said it a million times in this video, the Badlands is not a good place to be. And he starts at the tip top of that and has to work his way down with all the green skins and chaos and pretty much everything that's in there. Add on top of this, his extremely mediocre starting army in both locations, it means that he's going to struggle to win any early battles before he gets an army on the go, and he's going to have to build two armies at the same time, which puts a massive strain on the economy, and yes, I know it's high elves, but early game economy is not good for anyone. Enough to the point where they can have two decent armies on the go at the same time. Now, once he gets everything on the go and he gets all his mechanics working, and you know, Tor of Rest is leveled up, and the Athel Tamara is leveled up, and he gets some good units and the Mist Stalkers on his side, he's actually pretty good. But getting to that point is the real challenge. Corn, Scarbrand again, you know, no other choice, next faction. Now we come to Kislev, and I think for this one, it's pretty obvious that it has to be Big Boris Ursus. I mean, the guy literally doesn't start the settlement and he's literally taking the fight to Chaos, so he's gonna be battling his way through the Chaos Waste for pretty much the entire campaign, unless you decide to retreat and move into Norska to eventually work your way down to Kislev. If that isn't a rough start, I don't know what is. Now, admittedly, later on, he can do well, you know, with all the buffs he brings to bears, he's an excellent fighter himself, but to start with, he has it super rough, even with his very strong starting army. He's totally surrounded by enemies, and even being as powerful as he is, he's going to struggle to keep up the momentum to keep battling and fighting without losing his best units. Add on the fact he can barely use half of the Kislev mechanics, you know, he can't use the supporters mechanics, so he gets no buffs from that race, which the other two will get if they're doing well. He also won't be able to use later research unless he owns Kislev, Erengrad, and Prague, which he definitely won't unless he manages to get a big ball confederation, which he likely won't because confederation is way harder in Immortal Empires. This is one of those that is pretty much unarguable. Some people say that Boris is really strong, and he is, but the start is so rough. Standing on the Chaos Waste, you can barely use half the mechanics. Everything about him is just way more rough than it is for the other two. Even for poor Kostaltin, who starts right next to Azazel, and doesn't even start with his capital city under his control, he has it easier than Big Boris. Next, we come to the Lizardmen, and as always with the Lizardmen, it comes down to either Nakai or to Henoween. These two have always had it rough since they've been added to the game, and Immortal Empires is no difference. I think in the end, I'd have to give it to Nakai, since once Henoween gets the first stage of the Prophecy of Sotak out of the way, which he can do very, very quickly, he actually has a relatively normal campaign and can do whatever he wants, whereas Nakai, it's just so challenging and jarring from another Lizardmen campaign that it is just kind of the hardest by default, even though he has seen some massive improvements and is way easier and way better to play these days. He starts in a world of his own on the opposite end of the map to all his friends, and while he can use the sea lanes to get back, it's kind of a massive waste of time and puts him behind, so, you know, he kind of just has to do the best with what he got. On this side of the map, he has no allies, no friends whatsoever to speak of, so he pretty much just has to fight literally everyone to make any progress. Now, he has to build everything in his army and has no settlements of his own, so even if he conquers half the map and gifts it to the protectors of the old ones or whatever they're called, you know, if, if his army loses one battle or two battles in their own retreats and loses, basically if his army dies and he doesn't have another army on the go, his campaign is over, so you don't really get any forgiveness. You know, in some campaigns you can lose your army, and it's really, really bad, but you can eventually recover from it. So you can just use a, a load because you're not an idiot and it's a single player game. Who cares? If you save scum, it is a single player game. But yeah, if you lose your army as Nakai, the campaign is over. It is over. It is literally game over. The game over screen will come up and say, you lost, you suck, Nakai died, you big stinky loser player. Look at him, he sucks, he's bad at all. Well, look at him. And on the fact that the protects of the old ones don't protect shit, they, they, they are so easy to walk over. It's unbelievable, even with the buffs they've got. Yeah, they're, it's, they're just not very good. So you give them all this land and then they just lose it all anyway. See, so Vassal income goes down and the area where you can walk in safely goes down. 
pretty much everything goes down, it sucks. He has to fight tooth, nail and claw, quite literally, to make any progress whatsoever, and it can all be taken just like that. Now, honestly, part of this difficulty is because he's so different to the other lizard men, but nevertheless, he's still the worst and the hardest start for any of the lizard men. Now, we come to Norska, and uh, if you watch that video, you know what I said. Uh, Wolfric and Throg, in my eyes, pretty much the same. They can both take over the entirety of Norska if they want, they can both take the fight to the Empire whenever they want. Uh, they both start with relatively strong early game armies, you know, Wolfric has the Mammoth, Throg has himself and some trolls. Uh, but in the end, Wolfric was just easier because of his starting location, he had a better route to move down into the Empire, and he had less obstacles in his way and less major enemies. Throg just has it a little bit harder, he's got the Dwarves, he's got the Rats, he's got Chaos. He has a few more people standing in his way, potentially, of getting that massive chain confederation and taking over the whole of Norska. So, Throg is the hardest, but not by much. He's kind of just like very close second place but unfortunately it's of two so it's very close but in last place as i said you could probably go either way for this one but to me throg is the hardest start for noska here we are for nurgle and damn kugaf back at it again being loser by default yep one lord in the faction next please Next up we have the Ogre Kingdoms, and this is another two lord faction, so of course, if you watch the best lords for every faction, you know, uh, you know that Scrag is going to lose this one. Honestly, he deserves it. His starting location is so dire compared to Greasus, it is unbelievable. He has no potential allies, as I mentioned in the last video, the only ones that will maybe be friends with you is the Greenskins, that's only because you're destroying what well, they want to destroy, so once it's destroyed, there's no point being friends with them, because they won't care. For a guy who loves the Great Maw so much, he has certainly done an excellent job of putting as much space between him and it as possible. He starts almost on the opposite end of the map to the Great Mussy, with no friends or allies to speak of. Yes, his starting army is alright, but when you compare it to Greasus, he just doesn't have a chance. Greasus is surrounded by other ogres, he's got Zhao Ming right there who can be friends with. Greasus can be friends with nearly every single person that he starts next to, with the exception of his starting war. Whereas Scrag is pretty much destined to be at war with almost everyone that's nearby to him. He and his army is just fine as I said, but we just cannot compare to how goddamn easy Greasus has it with all his potential allies. Next comes to the Skaven, and honestly, compared to Ikit, Pretty much all the rats have a starting location that is 10 times harder, but one that sticks out from a combination of location and mechanics is Deathmaster Snitch. Now I know he can be exceptionally strong with his improved ambush stance and his stealth units, but the fact is you are forced to use Eshin only units or pay a massively increased amount of upkeep, and that means you are missing out on weapons teams, uh, any solid front lines, really strong monsters, plague units, pretty much any unit other than stealth you are not allowed to use without paying an extortionate amount of upkeep, and let's be honest, you likely won't be able to afford it, because the Skaven in the early game rely on stuff being cheap. Now on turn 1 this isn't too bad, you can get away with it, but the later into the campaign you get, the more turns go by, the more powerful enemy armies will become, and the more you're going to be thinking, damn I wish I had some weapons teams or anything else apart from stealth right now, because I'm certainly struggling. The moment the enemy gets armour, speed, flying, pretty much anything, your entire army is going to be screwed and running in terror. The rats have one of the strongest overall rosters in the game and blocking you out of most of it is just a recipe for a fairly difficult starting campaign. On top of this you start in the middle of the cafe lands and while everyone is out to get you in every scaven campaign, uh, this one literally everyone is out to get you and you are inside of the enemy fortress and going to have to fight your way out. Next up we have Slanesh, who do you think it's going to be Louis? It's all over lawbreaker, your spree is at an end. No you're wrong, it's Nakari you idiot. Next. Now we have the Tomb Kings, and I feel like this is another one where the choice is pretty damn clear. Katep is just far away from pretty much everything that he needs to be useful. It's far away from the deserts, where, you know, all of his, I mean, potential allies, if he could make any, would be. Uh, he is way further away from all the books than Magash, so he has to pray that one of the roaming ones just comes and plops itself in his doorstep. He's, uh, he's just far from everything. So, yeah, he's pretty much the hardest. All he has to look forward to is a campaign of fighting Dark Elves and Greenskins and literally everything in that area because no one will like him. And on top of all that, his starting army is pretty mid. Himself, also pretty mid. Sure, Icon has no Tomb King friends, but he starts in the desert. He's got that extra army from the Vampire Counts and can make friends with them. Orkatep has his slightly better priests, and that's it. Everybody close to him does not like him, and he's going to spend the entire campaign fighting to make any headway whatsoever. There's not really much else to say. He starts alone, has no friends, doesn't have a great army, doesn't have great campaign mechanics. That's about it. Siege. Kairos wins. Flawless victory. Next up, we come to the Vampire Coast, and again, I feel like this is one that has been pretty much obvious since the faction has come out, and uh, not many people can disagree with them. And uh, I'm, of course, talking about Araneth Assault Shite. Honestly, her uselessness stems from herself. Uh, she's a pretty terrible fighter, to be honest with you. I mean, she'll do fine in the early game when people don't have a lot of armor, but as soon as they have pretty much anything uh, armor-wise or anything-wise, she's going to struggle. She doesn't have a lot of uh, damage herself. She doesn't have a lot of armor herself. I mean, she's relatively fast, but that's about it. 
And the worst part is, she doesn't gain much over the course of the campaign. Sure, you can build into a yellow tree and make her a lot better at fighter, but she doesn't gain any spells, she doesn't gain any good mounts, she doesn't barely gain any good effects for her entire army, for goodness sake. Top of this, her starting army is pretty mid, and the Sartosan units, admittedly, are quite useful, but not useful enough to carry her battles. Top of this, her campaign mechanics, pretty useless. While they do allow her to make cash if she's doing well, uh, she has to be doing well first for that to happen. Now, the Vampire's faction overall, of course, isn't known for making friends, and Aranessa certainly doesn't start anywhere near to anyone that she could call a potential friend. Pretty much everyone there is a potential enemy, and uh, they're pretty damn strong potential enemies. And uh, I mean, you've got the Border Princes, and Tillier, and Estalia, who aren't too serious, but then you've got Ikit Claw, Belagor, Einhammer, the Wood Elves, and beyond that, Bretonia, and the Empire. You know, she has it pretty damn rough. Her army, whack. Herself, whack. Her campaign mechanics, whack. The way that she starts in a terrible location, whack. The rest of the vampires, they're tight as fuck. Now comes to the Vampire Counts, and it's a shame really, because now Hellman is pretty top tier, so picking a worse start for the Vampire Counts is a pretty close race. Uh, I think it really comes down to Manfred or Heinrich, which uh, I never thought I'd say. They both start in pretty dire locations with a lot of potential enemies. Of course, Manfred is down the Badlands in the desert, he's fighting the Tomb Kings, he's fighting uh, Volkmar, he's fighting all the other legendary lords that are now starting down there. Uh, whereas Heinrich is up in his mountain hold, surrounded by Bretonia and the Empire and Dwarves and the Wood Elves and, uh, you know, pretty much everyone. Uh, in the end, I think I'd have to give it to Heinrich and it is mostly because of the Lords. Now, to start off with, Manfred, he's a pretty decent fighter, he does good damage, he's got good armor, and then eventually he'll get those spells online and be even better. Uh, whereas Heinrich is a pretty much pure spellcaster, so in the early game isn't going to have much impact until he gets his spells online. Now, of course, he can get Krell, but by himself, Manfred can just do so much more than Heinrich. If you ask me. Now, this one is pretty close and could go either way, so, you know, don't take it too personally. In the long run, Manfred's location is probably quite a bit worse, and he will struggle uh, a lot longer than Heinrich will. Once he gets on the go, Heinrich will be a lot better. Uh, but to start off with, Heinrich 100% has it harder than Manfred, if you ask me. Since they rework, the Warriors of Chaos are one of the strongest factions, especially with their shiny new faction feeling that they've got at the moment. So choosing the worst one here is really quite a challenge. Now, I think in the end, and it pains me to say this because we all know how much I love the Plague Papa, I would have to give it to Festus. And it's really for a couple of reasons. First of all, his own power compared to the Overlords. Pretty much all of the Overlords are excellent fighters, so right out of the gate are going to get a ton of value. Uh, Festus, however, he doesn't do the most damage, and it takes a while for his spells and abilities to come fully online and have him having a huge impact in battles. His army is okay, but of course relying on a giant for all your damage isn't the best idea since as soon as the enemy gets some ranged on the go, uh, it's going to look like a damn pincushion. And finally, his starting location is challenging for a number of reasons. First of all, you know, the middle of the empire, never the best place to start. He's got a lot of potential enemies, he's got wood elves, and of course, you know, the million empire factions that are there, and once they all confederate, they'll all be a gag and take a piece of him. And also, the other part of the starting location, he doesn't have easy access to a bunch of dark fortresses. A lot of the dark fortresses are concentrated on the north of the map, and Festus starts kind of in the middle of it, so he's got one where he starts, and then maybe another couple before he has to move right up into the north to take over the rest of them. So he doesn't have a lot of expansion options uh, in his starting area, so he kind of just needs to leave it as soon as possible, which is kind of whack. Now he's still fairly strong and a lot of fun, but compared to the others, he offers the most challenge for sure. And finally, we come to the Wood Elves, and I think we're onto another safe bet for sure, and of course, that is Draika. I mean, she's not too bad, but compared to other three, she has it pretty rough. Now she can use the excellent ranged units of the Wood Elves, uh, but she can't use them to their full potential like the other three can. On top of this, she also pays extra upkeep for them, and while she does get this back in the form of the Beast of the Forest units, and you know, the bust to her Forest Spirit units, uh, she still is missing out on a major part of the strongest part of the roster in the Wood Elves. On top of this, she has no friends due to poor Wood Elf relations, and no one else really likes her because, uh, you know, she's a big scary tree, although she's kind of dumb with thick. She also starts outside of the Athaloran Forest and is not going to be able to confederate, so we'll have to fight to take it over, which is pretty challenging indeed. She's going to have to make her way all the way over there, build up a big army, and then take out the four major armies that are there on top of the Oak of Ages. No, thank you. And to top it off, she's not insanely powerful in battles early on. Her damage isn't insane. She doesn't have any spells yet, so she's just pretty mid overall. Her starting armor is okay, and the buffs to the Forest Spirit units are pretty good, but overall, she just has it way rougher than any of the other Wood Elves. If you want to play a Tree Spirit run, and you want it a lot easier, just play Durthu. But if you're looking for a challenge, then Draka certainly has that. And that is the list of the worst stats for every faction in Total War Warhammer 3. If you disagree with any of the options, please do leave a comment down below. Uh, I won't read them, but the engagement is very nice, so I will take that. If you like this video, then leave it a like. If you did not like this video, then leave it a like anyway. I really don't care. And be sure to subscribe to the channel so you never miss a video, and you keep up to date with every single one of these.
perfect uploads. And finally, if you are feeling a special big penis, then consider supporting the channel directly by becoming a member on YouTube or a Patreon on the Patreon. Doing so gets you early insights into future content, increased voting power, discounts on merch, as well as shout outs at the end of videos like Henry Tucker for his support at the officers tier. Thank you to all supporters, one last thank you for watching, and for now, I've been Colonel Damders, and I will see you next turn.